Hello and a very warm welcome to today's ICENTD Connect webinar. Um, today it's um, Tuesday, December the 1st, and um, the whole world around has been celebrating World AIDS Day. Uh, there's generally lots to celebrate on World AIDS Day, uh, as there has been tremendous progress for the patients and the public health professionals working in this space, whether it be uh, quality of life of patients, uh, stigma reduction, also improvement in diagnostics, the rollout of PrEP, uh, male circumcision. I mean, lots of interventions that have really defined the progress in HIV and AIDS. Um, unfortunately, this year, there is slightly less cause for celebration. Uh, as like for all of us, um, the work in this field has been severely impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, today, in fact, this morning, UNAIDS has called upon all the nations of the world uh, to really learn lessons from underinvesting in health and to step up global action to end AIDS and other pandemics. Now, HIV and AIDS is not normally considered within the neglected tropical disease uh, label. And so you might wonder, what does this have to do with NTDs? Um, and so today we are going to be talking about female genital schistosomiasis and how this could be the next big thing in HIV and AIDS control. And um, it's my greatest pleasure to welcome today two colleagues uh, who have been working in this field following very different, but at the same time, broad approaches, looking at all aspects of female genital schistosomiasis. And so I'd like you all to uh, well join me in welcoming and giving a very warm welcome to Professor Margaret Gyapong and uh, Dr. Maya Bustindi, who are joining us today as speakers. Um, good afternoon, both. Hello. Hi, Maya. Hi. Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, so, uh, Margaret, uh, Professor Gyapong, you are Director of the Institute of Health Research at the University of Health and Allied Research in Ghana. And Dr. Maya Bustindui, you are Associate Professor in Tropical Pediatrics at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And we've got about an hour ahead of us, uh, during which we're going to hear a lot more about um, the, the gaps in the understanding and in the research of uh, female genital schistosomiasis and how this impacts communities and women worldwide. We'll also hear a lot more about uh, improvements in diagnostics and work that you've done, uh, Dr. Bustindui. And so um, with no further ado, I'd like to hand over to you, Margaret. Thank you very much, uh, Marianne. And it's a pleasure to be on this panel today, um, World AIDS Day. Uh, which incidentally happens to be the birthday of my first daughter. So I'm quite excited um, this afternoon. But it's nice to have everybody with us, our colleagues from the NTD world and from Shisto and from HIV to listen to um, our session today. Um, it's come quite a long while talking about FGS and I hope we can all learn something from whatever we discuss today. And at the end of the day, look at the strategies for moving forward with this condition. Thank you very much. In 2005, my colleague, Professor Pascal Aloti and I were commissioned by WHO TDR to do a review of the evidence on NTDs with a gender lens. And as part of that review, we did a very short piece on gender and schistosomiasis, basically because we didn't find much information on the subject. As part of that review, we noted the work of three scientists, Feldmeyer et al. 1995, Paul Deman 1995, and Ayangwe et al. 1992. And following this report, I went on to do my other work on NTDs and never thought about FGS again. Ten years later, as part of my work on Countdown with my colleagues in Liverpool, I was asked to give a talk at the first ever FGS conference held in Johannesburg. My talk was supposed to be on putting FGS on the maternal health agenda. 
and initially I was totally confused. I had no clue about the subject and I didn't know how to proceed. Then I remembered the review on neglected tropical diseases I had done 10 years earlier and found what had been written about FGS in the 1990s. And so I asked at that meeting, if issues about FD, FGS were put in the literature as far back as the early 1990s, why are we still talking about FGS and not acting on it? The main scope of the workshop was to present the latest findings on genital schisto and mass treatment for NTDs, determining the new research agendas on interactions between HIV and schisto, and advocate for interventions against NTDs, and then advocate for the inclusion of FGS on the maternal health agenda. Now, what exactly are we talking about? Schistosomiasis already is a disease of poverty, and in many African countries, due to lack of potable water, families depend on water bodies for their daily needs. Women go to the riverside to wash, to bathe, to clean their pots and pans, and children swim and have fun in the river. Some of our colleagues who visit us from the north do same. But we found out that women and children perform these activities out of necessity and oblivious to the dangers that these water bodies pose to their health. I want us to pay particular attention to the picture I'm showing right now. The woman in a bit to protect her child puts the baby in a basin of water fetched from the same water source. The child sits in the water to let mother complete her chores. To what extent is this child exposed to schistosomiasis? And it is not surprising that control programs focus their attention on children, especially those in school, sometimes to the detriment of those outside schools. Now, what are the challenges of FGS looking at the sociocultural context? And why haven't we done much or heard much about FGS? Probably because it affects marginalized and voiceless women in Africa and the Middle East who suffer silently and cannot talk about issues related to their sexuality. In Ghana, for instance, blood in urine amongst men is a sign of male maturity. But in women, bleeding between periods, long periods of menses, bleeding after sex, could be something seen as normal. There are challenges with stigma related to infertility, the woman is to blame, and she finds herself in a polygamous marriage because her husband has to find another woman who will bear him children. There are issues around delayed puberty and irregular menses. And for the poor children, we ask who listens to them and who do they talk to when they are suffering from some of these conditions? How do they describe what is going wrong with them and what is the response that we give to the children. So following this workshop, the team on Countdown decided to draw a lot more attention to the issues of FGS because we realized it's a subject that needed to be advocated on. So we put together an article in a not too conventional scientific journal which is the open democracy. But we felt the need to, in an unconventional way, draw attention to FGS. And in that article, we asked why this important issue had been under-researched and misunderstood. We documented the situation in Ghana and presented a future agenda for action to ensure that this neglected tropical disease is put on the maternal health agenda to gain the necessary action. Since then, there have been several publications on the subject. Notable among them is one by Chris Net et al. 2016, also shedding more light on the condition and calling for a concerted action against this disease. In the last couple of years, it has been heartwarming to note that a lot of attention is being drawn to the condition in the World Health Organization 
through webinars and international conferences, and the more recently ended HIV conference where there was a whole session on FGS. It is even more heartwarming to note that following the HIV conference, WHO and UNAIDS in 2019 put out this publication titled No More Neglect, Female Genital Schisto and HIV, Integrating Reproductive Health Interventions to Improve Women's Life. And the long and short of this entire document is a call for an integrated approach to solving the problems of FGS. Following that publication, my colleagues and I, Dirk Engels and Muele from WHO NTD program, put together this publication in the WHO Bulletin. And we discuss how female genital schistosomiasis control can be integrated with HIV and cervical cancer care. And we think these will be part of a broader framework of sexual and reproductive health and rights, women's empowerment, and social justice in Africa. So we continue to put out the publications, and there are several other publications by Amaya and team on the clinical aspects of female genital schisto. But for the next couple of slides, I'd like to focus on this article that we put together as part of the countdown activities in Ghana, where having generated the interest in FGS, we decided to try to understand what health workers and community members were thinking. And we actually looked at the reality of living with FGS in a schisto endemic community in Ghana. And having gone through the process, it appeared as if the secret of these young women and these girls actually became their shame, particularly because of the way they were treated in the community and the way they were treated when they arrived at the health facility. So this was a purely qualitative study which we conducted in the eastern part of the greater Accra region in Ghana. It's a farming and fishing community and it has the Volta River located on the eastern part of the district. We strategically chose 15 communities from this part of the district because of their proximity to the lake and the fact that they use the lake for most of their economic and household activities. We conducted in-depth interviews and focus group discussions with healthcare providers, community members, adult male and females, and boys and girls in and out of school. Now, what did we find? Community members and people in, 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 in schools and even out of school had different perceptions about FGS. In one of the focus group discussions, they believe that married women and girls sleep with married men and God always punishes them with the condition. But then they also believe that boys face the greatest risk and then pass this uh, condition to women. So boys and girls have different symptoms. Boys only have bloody urine, but with me, I had abdominal pains, painful and itching vagina and stopped menstruating. So the girls can pick out the signs and symptoms. And what we did was to pre present to them a vignette because we didn't know a local name for FGS. We just knew schistosomiasis. So having talked about the signs, people were able to pick up what we were talking about and then describe what they had experienced um, when they claimed that they had had um, the condition. Now, what are the community and health workers thinking or what is the understanding of schisto and FGS. An adult female in a focus group discussion said, when you eat sugar cane from the river bank, you will swallow the snail and it will hatch in your stomach and cause schistosomiasis. And then a teacher, somebody who is supposed to have been trained and is supposed to be delivering praziquantel to teach, uh, children in the schools, indicate that married women and girls sleep with married men and God always punishes them with their condition. Boys and girls, however, have different symptoms and boys only have bloody urine, but with this particular girl, she had abdominal pains, painful itching, painful and itching vagina, and she stopped menstruating. Now, my concern is with our midwives and our healthcare providers. 
One midwife said she had worked in the district for 12 years and had never seen a girl report with bloody urine. It is always the boys. I don't think the girls get the disease from the lake like the boys. And a community health officer then said, I've never heard the girls complain about urinating blood. It is only the boys. Girls may have some defense against Chisto from the lake, and only the men can give it to them. So if our healthcare providers don't understand what the condition is, and they, they, their interpretation of this condition is that girls don't get it, and it is only boys who can give it to them, then we are not surprised at some of the things that they are telling the young girls, which makes them mistrust the health system. So we, I picked up one of these quotes from a 17-year-old girl who said, when the girls report to the clinic with vaginal itching, discharge or pain, the nurses always start to advise you to avoid sex or use a condom for protection. Even sometimes they can tell your mother that you are having sex and so you can get HIV. They will talk for a long time and will not tell you that you have schistosomiasis or request you to do any test but they will say you have STI and give you drugs for STI. That is why we, the young girls, don't go to the clinic. So from this quote, we can pick up a number of things. One, the nurses themselves don't trust the young girls and do not understand what it is when the girls have the symptoms of FGS. The, the young girls are stigmatized. Their parents are informed, so this um, privacy is broken and the trust is broken between the young girls and the health system. And, and then to add more problems to the issue, um, they say that they have an STI and it's interesting that the children themselves know that they have schisto and I believe it is coming from the education that they are given in their schools before receiving MDA with Praziquantel. So we ask ourselves, what action is needed for this? It is important for there to be a curriculum revision for pre-service health training institutions. There must be refresher training for specialists and healthcare providers at various levels of the healthcare system. There's the need to link with existing programs that are already screening women so that we don't have parallel systems running. Already in various countries, there are cervical cancer screening, there are well women clinics, there are HIV clinics where women are being engaged in various forms. And the issue of FGS can be linked with many of these existing activities. There must be community sensitization and health education, not only to community members, but also to our healthcare providers. And there must be proper linkages with various government departments and agencies. From what I've described and the issue of people using the river bodies for their normal household work, FGS then becomes not just a health issue but a developmental issue, an issue of poverty and all hands need to come on board. Then critical is reporting this condition through routine health systems. Up till the beginning of this year, nobody was reporting anything on genital schisto in Ghana. But through our work in Countdown, we had been advocating for the NTD program to include ind indicators of neglected tropical diseases, particularly genital schisto, into the routine healthcare delivery system. And I'm glad to say that just last month, I got confirmation from the NTD program that this has happened. And I'll show you what the form looks like pretty soon. But another important thing is the fact that FGS has been captured in the NTD 2030 roadmap and it means that some action is going to happen and knowing um, the leader of the NTD program, Mwele, and the fact that this is a woman and girls issue, I know that these issues will be taken forward. So this is the form I was talking about. Currently, um, Ghana will be reporting in our uh, DHMIS2 um, conditions related to genital schisto and will be capturing for both male and female and that is a step in the right direction and I hope that our colleagues from other countries will put in a lot of effort to get FGS reported through the routine health service. It took us almost three years to get this to happen 
But please don't give up. It is possible and it can happen. So moving on from Countdown and the publications and the various meetings and conferences that have happened, some of us decided that we needed to take things a step further. So together with my colleagues from the Berea Research Institute, Alison Krentel, and Bridges to, Bridges to Development, Julie Jacobson, and our colleagues from the Ministry of Health in Madagascar and Ghana, we put together a proposal which were titled the FAST package. And FAST stands for FGS Accelerated Scale Together Package. And it's a package where we feel that different components of issues that need to deal with um, FGS need to be brought together in one setting so that we could actually take hold of the problem and deal with it appropriately. We launched this project in September of this year and we have funding from um, Grand Challenges Canada um, through Global Affairs Canada to be able to support this. So the project period is from July 1st um, this year to March 30th, 2022. And we have much funding from MEC Global Health Institute, the Schistosomiasis Control Initiative Foundation, the NTD Support Center, and WHO ESPEN. And to these groups, we are extremely grateful that they, they were willing to um, contribute much funding to support the grants that we got from Grand Challenges Canada. Now, we are looking at an integrated approach because under normal circumstances, when a condition is being dealt with, you find out that the different components that come to bear are handled separately by different individuals, different institutions, and everybody works in a vertical way. But we feel that as part of the FAST package, we need to pull issues and activities together. And so that is what we are doing with the FAST package in dealing with um, FGS. For diagnosis and treatment, we are looking at it through integrated services with STI, HIV, family planning, maternal, neonatal and child health, and cervical cancer. For community awareness, we are ensuring that community members are aware of FGS risks and its impact and using whichever means are appropriate at the community level to be able to create this awareness working with communities themselves to understand how they themselves can work with us to ensure that this message goes wrong. With regards to training of medical personnel, we are looking at training them to recognize, treat and record FGS in adolescent girls and women in reproductive age. Remember, in the focus group discussions and in-depth interviews that we conducted, their knowledge about FGS is next to nothing. And when it comes to prevention of new cases, we are working with the NTD programs to ensure that praziquantel is made available for administration to children in schools and at community level so that women and children out of school would have access to the treatment. One great feature of the um, FAST package is the setting up of FGS national committees. In all our countries, there may be national NTD committees. However, we think that there must be a specific FGS committee that brings together neglected tropical disease control programs and other related sectors. And for the first package, we have funding from WHO ESPEN to be able to carry this through and for which we are really grateful. We are hoping that with setting up of these committees, there will be increased communication and collaboration about FGS with a longer term goal of integrating FGS into existing clinical training and care. And of course, like I said earlier, into routine healthcare delivery systems. And we also hope that these committees will serve as a foundation for future coordination and integration of other NTD related activities within the national health system. Now I talked about different agencies supporting the FAST package. And on this slide, I'm showing where their donation comes in. So the NTD Support Center and MEC, Global Health Institute, are working with us in the training of clinicians and care providers, in the development of core competencies for training, the, an online training platform with the Geneva Learning Foundation, 
where quite a bit of work has gone on already. And then with technical support provided by WHO um, Geneva. And like I said earlier on, WHO SPEN is supporting the FGS national committees. SCIF will be supporting the social mobilization at the communities and in the school, and SCIF is also supporting the MDA in Madagascar. MEC is supporting the donation of Quasiquantel to Ghana and Madagascar um, for the delivery through MDA in both countries. Ladies and gentlemen, whilst I've been speaking and during the time we are on this webinar, children are still swimming in the water bodies. Women are still performing household chores in the water bodies. Our frontline health workers are still ignorant about the condition and misdiagnosing women and children. Our gynecologists are not fully aware of FGS and are still not asking basic questions regarding where women have lived in the past and their lifestyle. And women and girls are still being stigmatized. So there's something that we can all contribute. We have researchers, we have funding organizations, we have NGOs, we have civil society organizations that can all contribute towards ensuring that we deal with this condition. It's been a long journey, as I said from the beginning, and we have to start acting immediately. So to conclude, let me say that we are not just dealing with parasites and statistics alone, but with people who are related to you and I. Their suffering is unacceptable in the 21st century, and they are looking up to us to help address their problem in a holistic way to prevent stigmatization and all the other things that go with having FGS. I thank you for support, and I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Margaret, for that. Um, and no power cuts on your side while the, the video was playing, so that, that's all good news. Um, it's been an amazing journey to see it all summarized uh, within those few minutes from those three sparse papers from the 90s all the way um, to this hugely collaborative effort with a lot of progress, whether it be on a technical side or on a funding uh, level with the FAST package and uh, lots of partners coming on board. And so hopefully this goes out uh, loud and clear to the NTD community, but also to the HIV AIDS community. Um, so thank you very much for, for this brilliant overview and we'll be watching this space definitely. Uh, also, a very big thank you to the uh, Global Schistosomiasis Alliance and to Anu Guvras, uh, David Rawlinson, who have been posting resources. Um, if you haven't had a look on the chat and you would like to follow up on some of the things Margaret was discussing, please don't hesitate uh, to go on there. Thank you also to Denise Turley, who's put a link um, there for everyone. And so um, I'd like to move on now uh, to Dr. Bustin Jay's presentation. And then perhaps uh, we could reconvene after this for a few questions from the audience uh, and maybe just a, a more general discussion. Lots of expertise and many very familiar names in the attendees and audience as well. Um, so over to you, Amaya, and we'll regroup in a few moments. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me, Mayan. A uh, huge thank you to you and ISNTD, as well as the GSA, Anouk, as always, and David Rawlinson for being the greatest advocates for female genital schistosomiasis. And probably just uh, a little bit of an explanation and why I chose the title that I did, Schistosoma Hematobium's Neglected Child. And this really came because I always feel, although things are changing very, uh, very rapidly, uh, that morbidity and particularly FGS has not been at the forefront of uh, the schistosomiasis world. Um, and rightfully so, probably control programs have absorbed most of the of the spotlight. And I think we can definitely work together to bring both, uh, both things at the same time. So yes, today is definitely World AIDS Day. Uh, it is, it is, um, 
a very important day for clinicians, for social scientists, for the world in general. And believe it or not, it's only a 40 year old child. So uh, AIDS or HIV AIDS is really a middle age problem, uh, whereas schistosomiasis is really a problem of centuries. And uh, we'll see how it all comes together. But I wanna take the opportunity to also bring up the issue of cervical cancer. And for those of you that uh, were not uh, familiar with it or were not aware, WHO launched the first um, elimination campaign for a cancer. So that is really exciting news. It happened last week and both disease are very much linked to FGS as you hopefully will see in a moment. And there is definitely a lot of geographical overlap and a lot of ecological associations between HIV and schistosoma hematobium. So S. hematobium affects about 75 million people in the world. And here on the right, you see the HIV prevalence focusing on the incidence in young women. And there is definitely an overlap, particularly in the southern part of the continent. When you look at secondary infertility, which is the incapacity for a woman to become pregnant, you see that there is definitely an overlap, a geographical overlap with the published studies on FGS. And it all sort of starts making sense. And you always have to remember that we're extrapolating a lot of this information from barely 10,000 women, perhaps a few more, uh, because now there's many more of us working in the field, but we really don't have have a lot of first-hand information just yet. Um, and what about control programs? So yes, they do have an impact and definitely presequential given as MDA does have an impact on subfertility. This is some work from Kenya showing you the rates of uh, subfertility, which is again, the incapacity of a woman to become pregnant at, at, the, uh, at the speed that she would like to or at the numbers that she would like to. And if that woman um, receive presequential before the age of 21, the fertility, the subfertility rate is about 25%, and receiving presequential treatment after the age of 21, so way past the MDA age, it goes all the way to 70%. So again, there is a link between uh, preventing FGS and the role of presequential. Just as a little reminder, probably this audience won't need it, uh, but I always like to emphasize that schistosomiasis and also going away from the STI world uh, in terms of transmission is always very linked to water, is very linked to uh, the environment, just like Margaret was emphasizing over and over in her, in her talk. We do need those snails, so obviously it's all very linked to the water and aquatic environment and the household chores and the activities that happen in, uh, in the villages. But to then go through that life cycle, one has to always remember that those worms will mature in the vascular system. And that is where all the problems begin in terms of human disease, once those worm pairs start mating inside the vascular system. And this takes me, of course, to urogenital schistosomiasis and where those worms live um, in terms of the vascular system, draining all the organs in the pelvis of a woman in this particular case. So that includes obviously the uterus, the bladder, the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, the cervix and the vagina. And of course, from a clinical point of view, the things that are very accessible to us in terms of diagnosis will be the cervix and the vagina, but one should never really forget that inside there's many things happening and those things are only amenable to diagnosis and treatment after, for example, surgery. And that of course uh, limits the number of women that get diagnosed um, in those, in those um, uh, events. Now, the younger the woman is, the more likely she is to have those lesions in the exterior side of the genital tract. So an older woman will have those eggs in the ovaries and the uterus more than um, in the outside vagina, for example. This is what a biopsy looks like. And these clumps of eggs, this is the schistosoma hematobium with the terminal spine eggs inside the cervix. So as you can see, they are fairly uh, far from the actual um, outside of the cervix and the clumps 
form a granuloma and all these cells around it are just the inflammation around those eggs that cause all the morbidity associated with FGS. And how does it manifest? Well, like I mentioned, the thing that us clinicians can look at is the cervix, because that's really what you can see in front of your eyes. Um, and of course, our colleagues from Zimbabwe, from Norway, put together, and from Zambia as well, this absolutely amazing resource for a clinical diagnosis. It is freely available online for all practitioners, and it shows the uh, most uh, classic characteristic of FGS, in the cervix. Now, you always have to remember that we are missing the, the rest of the story, but at least we can see these clumps of eggs, which gives a yellow hue as grainy patches. And as Erin Ketlin always says, you can actually hear these grainy patches with a spatula. Then there will be flat, homogeneous, sandy patches, which are the same eggs, but in a flatter environment. The abnormal vessels, which is that friable mucosa, which means that you can actually make that cervix bleed as you touch it. And then finally, the rubbery papules, which are these little clumps of eggs, if you biopsy them, that can be confounded with other gynecological disorders. So if you see any of these, and this is part of the training, of course, of clinicians, this is FGS. Now, what about symptoms? I think Margaret really said it very eloquently. There is a lot of um, thinking about sexual transmitted infections, and rightfully so. You can treat STIs. Normally, in endemic settings, you can treat them without a diagnosis. There is a syndromic approach, meaning if you come to clinic with any of these symptoms right here, abdominal pain, discharge, um, pains with coitus or bleeding or genital itch, you will be giving antibiotics for um, STIs in general. Now, you can have FGS as well, and that is what gets missed. So it is important to treat the STIs because women can have both, but also to think about FGS and what happens with treatment. Those symptoms do um, get better, but one never knows if the symptoms came from one um, clinical manifestation or the other, the picture is never clean as much as we would like it to be. And what about the intersection where we are behind our colleagues working in cervical cancer, we are behind on our colleagues working even on HIV, even with 40 years of uh, history under their belt. And the, the, the crosses that I illustrated here really bring the level of evidence, the strong associations that know exist. So for example, HIV and STIs are very, very strongly linked to cervical cancer. There is a six-fold increase of um, cervical cancer in women that have HIV compared to those women that don't have HIV. There is, of course, a, a very strong evidence on cervical cancer impacting sexual and reproductive health, of course. And as you can see here on the left, FGS is linked to everything else, but the level of evidence is low which means that definitely we need to strengthen that mm. because that will give us much more um, tools and much more weapons to change policy and in include it in programs. So let's focus a little bit on HIV. There is definitely a biological plausibility. This um, diagram here just shows you how easy it is from going from a genital normal environment with a healthy mucosa and epithelium all the way down to HIV acquisition by means of being exposed to schistosoma hematobium infection, having those granulomas. And also we know from the literature that there is recruitment of immune cells that will have the receptors that help HIV get into the system, the CCR5. We also know that there are cytokines that may change the environment in the presence of FGS that will perhaps include um, a transmission for HIV. And just watch this space because our group will bring more evidence to the table soon. And what about cervical cancer? Like I mentioned, there is definitely an interplay between all of them and the evidence is scarce so far. But this is a very interesting study, I think, from Zimbabwe, in which they follow 37 women, so small sample size, but definitely found an association between high risk HPV and FGS at baseline. And they also found that after those 
five years, FGS was indeed associated with neoplasia. So obviously the evidence is not strong, but the suggestion is there and we just need to keep strengthening that. We performed the first study on um, linking FGS and cervical cancer via, via VIA, which is visual inspection with acetic acid. This is the method of choice that WHO recommends for the diagnosis of precancerous lesions in low income countries. Essentially, it's a little bit of vinegar to the cervix that will detect those proteins that are more present in precancerous lesions. It's a white plaque. Uh, and our master student here, Hannah, went to Zambia and found a six-fold increase in VIA positivity in women that had FGS as detected by PCR. So again, we are all working towards gathering more evidence to the uh, strength of association between all of these diseases that is um, obviously there. But how do you diagnose it? So we're, we're all doing research. We have good ideas about integration, but how do you actually detect these things in the field? It's not so simple. The gold standard, of course, is to identify those eggs in the cervix. Histopathology is the gold standard, but it has issues. So first of all, it's expensive. Uh, it's not available everywhere for resources. It also is linked to, um, to an increase of transmission of STIs and HIV if you don't allow that mucosa to heal. So when you do a biopsy, it has to be in a very controlled environment, making sure that there is no um, sexual activity within two weeks, which is of course, might be difficult in, in some settings, and then it's expensive. You also need, for those images that I showed you, a colposcope that is about 10 to $20,000, if not more, to have, and you need a very well-trained practitioner to be able to use it. There are some countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that may have one colposcope, two, or not even that. Then you can go to uh, surrogate markers, proxy markers, which are, for example, PCR that has great correlation with genital lesions. But of course, you have to work in an environment that has PCR uh, technology. And like I will mention a little bit later on, there are some novel um, approaches um, that uh, have that molecular capacity at the point of care with the RPA, for example. And then, of course, you always have the urine and the egg counts that is very poor correlate of what's really happening in the genital tract. So we wanted to test the hypothesis of actually bringing the diagnosis to the community, decentralizing, instead of getting a few women attending um, the hospital, how about going door to door? And the idea was really based on studies that were already happening on HPV, human papillomavirus self swab, self-testing, HIV self-testing. There is a push to really try to bring to the communities diagnoses that have been um, accessible for just a few in tertiary hospitals. And what we did is we trained our field workers to go door to door and explain to the women how to actually properly do a self swab. So this is one of our workers with a 3D model of a vagina and a cervix explaining how you have to insert the swab until you feel a little bit of resistance. Um, we also brought in with us the Atlas of Visual Diagnosis to explain to the women that this was not an STI, that this had nothing to do with sexual encounters, but that it, it gave those lesions to the cervix that were so difficult to treat and diagnose. And then of course, we wanted to see how acceptable all of this was because you may have good ideas, but if the community doesn't absorb it, just like Margaret was saying, you need to do a lot of community awareness, um, then it's just useless. So we wanted to see that they actually liked this and they, they did feel very empowered by being able to do these swaps at home as well. And these are the results. Uh, we were actually very encouraged by them because what we found was that the sensitivity was high for cell swaps compared to um, a service provider clinician obtained samples in terms of PCR, in terms of DNA detection of the parasite, it was up to 80%. And then when we subselected women that had active schistosomiasis by CAA positivity, which is the circulating anodic antigen, we found that 89 out of 100 women that had the disease 
would have a positive PCR. So obviously this really validated the fact that you could do PCR in the community um, as well as doing it in clinic. And this is by no means uh, a commercial advertisement of this particular colposcope, but this is the one we use, and there are some so many others out there. Essentially, it's a handheld colposcope that is a lot cheaper than the the big ones that I showed you just uh, earlier, and it provides an image that then can be translated into an image that one can uh, review in a cloud and be easily accessible, and you can train midwives and uh, um, low-skilled workers to use it. So again, with the idea of decentralizing images, we work with our colleagues from Zambia and Norway to try to establish an algorithm. Uh, Sigve has developed an algorithm to pick up the colors of those lesions, of those very characteristic lesions of FGS, and put them in a machine learning algorithm to try to pick them up without needing to go for expert review. Right now is still under development, um, but what you can see here, and perhaps the image is not very clear, mm. but you see on one side, these are actually images from the point of care colposcope in Zambia. And I, I do appreciate that they might be a little bit um, uncomfortable for people to look at, but FGS is a bad disease in general. So here you go. And the computer analysis is already picking up those yellow lesions. You can see here from that blue lines, actually getting those lesions even without the expert review image. Because what we found was that when we had two expert reviewers look at the images, they didn't really agree that much. So there was a poor correlation between it. And this always happens in clinical medicine. Um, the eyes work in very different ways. When we use the computer algorithm, which is the column in the middle, the pink one, we found that about half of our women had um, lesions, which is probably an overestimation as well. And the most accurate estimation in the cohort was very likely when we added the expert review consensus with the computer analysis. And we found that 25% of our cohort had lesions compatible with FGS. Now, putting it all in context, what you see here is that if we had just relied on the urine microscopy, which is what some people advocate that we do, we would have missed that 25% of lesions that may have actually urine microscopy negative. And this really talks about the temporal association with more chronic lesions in older women and more um, active lesions in, in younger women as it's illustrated right here. Uh, the PCR positivity in younger women was higher than in older women. And this means that these women that are over 30 probably have had that infection for decades and right now may not be shedding as much as many eggs or having as much uh, DNA in their genital tract, but are definitely having lesions. So we cannot forget about those uh, when we think about control and treatment, of course. So in conclusion, we, we were very happy with the results. Cervical swabs detect more cases than vaginal swabs. And in general, if you use cervical and vaginal, you will detect more cases than in cervical vaginal lavage, which is the one that the midwives perform in clinic or the gynecologist. When you use a composite FGS diagnosis as a reference standard, which was all the PCRs positive, sensitivity was 80%. And then when you subselected women with active schistosomiasis by CAA, that sensitivity went up to 89%. So it, it is setting the ground of decentralizing genital diagnosis. But how do you treat FGS? It is really not so simple. Um, this is straight from the FGS Atlas of Visual Diagnosis. This is still what WHO recommends, which is 40 milligrams per kilo as a single dose. Um, it may have some effect on the inflammation on eggs, but not in women that have had this infection for a very long time. The evidence is not strong so far. I know that there are some studies coming which are very, very needed, but this is the very little evidence that we have on the reversibility 
uh, of lesions after prosequential. So look at the sample sizes, nine in Malawi, 338 in Zimbabwe, and um, a match study in South Africa. The follow-up was also very uh, different, five weeks, 12 months, and eight months. And then the disparity of results is also quite remarkable. So one out of nine women had resolution of sandy patches in a, in a very small study. Uh, and 276 out of the 338 had some residual morbidity in Zimbabwe with some CCR5 receptor cells decreased in South Africa. So obviously it is really very important that we do proper treatment studies, not only MDA studies and the effect of control, but to actually think of individual level treatment. This is from our study in, um, in Zambia. One year later, just to show you that after a single dose of prasiquantil on 30 women that we followed, the lesion was exactly the same. And then, you know, it's the complications that those lesions will have in the sexual and reproductive health of those women. So briefly now, really, just to give you some conclusions on the things that we know, that we know the known knowns, the full body of that hippo is that FGS affects normal sexual and reproductive health of girls and women. You've heard Margaret before as a true advocate and the way forward with that really very encouraging package that they're proposing. FGA complications are preventable with MDA, but we cannot forget that we have millions of women that are no longer receiving MDA, that are not in the age cutoffs that we still need to think about. FGS is very likely associated with comorbidities, but the evidence is poor. Community-based diagnosis is feasible, acceptable, and it is as, as at least as good as clinic-based diagnosis. But the things that we still don't know about FGS is the true burden of disease. So we are again extrapolating a lot from the few studies that we're doing. And then there's very few women that have been surveyed for FGS and cervical cancer, for example, with very large heterogeneity of methods. So we need to come together and just establish some standardized approach to this. We don't know really the age of debut of symptoms and those clinical signs. It is difficult when you don't when you rely on women being sexually active, of course, and then how do we treat FGS? And I'm talking about those lesions that remain after a single dose prasequantil. There is a lot for us to study um, epidemiologically about the interplay between all these diseases, cervical cancer, HIV, and overall sexual health. We're running behind HIV and, and cervical cancer programs, but we're very rapidly catching up. And I think I just wanna finish with this so that everyone reminds themselves that a woman can have all of these at the same time. That it is challenging, particularly for us in FGS, to try to tease it out from the rest, but a woman can really have them all. So it is good to think in terms of integrating services for all of it and emphasizing what Margaret showed. There is definitely a push at a policy level. WHO is listening and many more of us are working on this. So I really always like to finish by acknowledging our field team. Um, to, to really conduct community-based studies requires a lot of effort and particularly from our absolutely brilliant teams in the clinic and in the field as well, as, as well as our collaborators all over the world. So I think I'll stop right there, Marianne. Wow, a huge thank you uh, to both of you presenters. Um, two very different presentations, but really um, laying out and mapping the complex and wide range of issues that surround female genital schisto. Also, the huge amount of progress. Um, we, we've had quite a few comments uh, here in the chat. Um, uh, Professor Alan Fenwick saying it's a shame we didn't think of these issues back in 2002, but clearly in good hands now <laughs> and uh, some incredible progress, as you say, at policy level at the WHO, um, but also ending on kind of that very sobering uh, conclusion, that diagram, Amaya, that you showed of what women uh, can face at, at the same time. Um, so. 
kind of, we we do have a few minutes to um it was a lot of material to cover we do have a few moments for some questions or some discussions and perhaps uh just the first thing i'd like to ask both of you from all of this uh what do you think in the future you would like to focus on as a priority or what do you think of are some of the issues or strategies that should first be tackled to really accelerate uh, work and progress in FGS? <laughs> Margaret. I mean, I, as you know, uh, my major concern is people's understanding of what the issue is. Once our health workers understand and know what it is, then when women arrive at the health facility, then they can adequately diagnose and then treat. But listening to Amaya, there's a lot of ground that needs to be covered for the diagnosis and then the treatment. Um, so first of all, getting them to understand what it is, because informal discussions with some of our medics, when you ask them, do you know about FGS? They're like, what is that? Um, so we are kind of excited about the fast package because from the service, the baseline service, we are really going to document properly what is known about it and whether people recognize and understand the science. And like I said earlier, till now, we haven't been reporting it in our routine health systems. So following all the things we are going to do in the first package, I hope that we'll see some documentation on it. So my first thing is getting our health workers to understand what it is, to know how to diagnose and then treat it. And then we get our community members also to understand what it is and how to prevent it. And uh, on that note, uh, Hilary Adi from uh, the University of Calabar in Calabar Cross River State, Nigeria has echoed that by saying, thank you very much for your beautiful presentations. I will try and bring this to the fore of my place of work. So you're already reaching new colleagues. Um, Amaya, what, what do you think? No, I, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with Margaret. I think if, if people don't know what they're looking for, it will never happen. So that is step number one, two, and three. And then it, it always has to be part of any program. But for me, it's definitely diagnostics. Um, after covering that ground and working with fabulous people like Margaret um, uh, in social science, we need, we need to bring diagnostics that are um, as close to the user as possible, decentralizing as, as much as possible. Um, so I, I work with Bonnie, Bonnie Webster from the Natural History Museum that has developed the RPA, which is a point of care molecular assay to bring it to small clinics to uh, as, as closer to the user as possible, because without a diagnosis, then we're just giving worry to the, all these women we're giving them all this information that that is very scary and we're telling them that the treatment may not be that great so we, we just need to offer them that diagnostic capability at the same time um we we have a small problem is that we now have a deluge of questions <laughs> <laughs> and so I was just wondering whether Margaret and Amaya, you might have a few minutes to answer these. Um, the time for our webinar is up. I'm more than happy to stay uh, connected. It's entirely up to you. Fine, it's, it's okay. Margaret. I, I can stay for another maybe five, ten minutes. I have another call. Um, All right. One of my projects. So, yeah, that's the few minutes. We'll be very quick then. Thank you, Margaret. Um, so you just mentioned uh, Bonnie Webster, Amaya, and so Bonnie's on the call. Hello, Bonnie, and uh, say, just commenting, excellent work, thank you, and asking, is there a relationship between infection intensity and FGS? Would you expect FGS to be a problem in a setting that has been at the elimination level for some time with ongoing low-level transmission, for example, in Zanzibar? Yes. Definitely. So the, the data that we have from Zambia is a low prevalence setting. And we definitely found that there was a correlation between two positive PCRs, so women that had more DNA, more parasite DNA in their genital tracts and the rest of the complications from FGS, even in a low prevalence setting. The, the area that I showed was only 5% by urine microscopy, so really considered low prevalence. Uh, and so there is a lot of disease there that is just going unnoticed. 
Margaret, would you like to add to this? Um, no, I think Amaya has captured it. I haven't done many of the kind of studies that Abaya has done, just this one study on perceptions and understanding. So I, that's all I could say for now. Mm -hmm. uh, Jolie Chami is asking, first of all, thanking you, thank you to both presenters. And how are you addressing the issue of temporality with co-infections, HIV, or comorbidities, cancer, what precedes what? And perhaps in a more general sense, um, how do you both view um, comorbidities or co-infections and FGS? And what's the next steps forward? Perhaps Margaret. Um, I think uh, the slide that Amaya showed was a classic one with the woman in the middle and all the uh, other infections, but it happens with quite a number of people in lower and middle income countries. Today it's FGS, tomorrow it will be malaria and something else and another thing and another thing. So these things are inevitable. And that is why we are talking about the fact that there needs to be an integrated approach to handling this rather than going in a vertical way. So today it's the person doing cervical cancer screening who comes to examine the woman and doesn't check for other things. And tomorrow it's the FGS group coming to examine the same woman to check and doesn't pick on HIV or something else. So an integrated approach to dealing with this, I think, um, should be the best way to go forward. It's the same woman. There may be different programs, but it's the same woman. And we don't want her to um, go through unnecessary examinations just because everybody's thinking in their own silo. We must be willing to work together and realize that that's the way we can solve some of these issues at the community level. Brilliant. Exactly. I think you hit it in the head, Margaret. It's that first you have to treat that woman with whatever she presents with exactly. and all those programs together. And then there are the other very interesting questions of temporality and, and all of that, which of course, as researchers, we love to approach, but but those programs need to focus on, on, the, on the task at hand, which would be access to care for HIV, treatment for cervical cancer and diagnosis, and then getting the FGS component within it as well. It's very complicated. I mean, it sounds easy, but this is, this is a major, major endeavor for any, and you know better, Margaret, from integrating this in a health system. Um, an interesting question here from uh, Stephen Bramer, who's asking, is FGF transmissible to the husband? Uh, or perhaps that could lead us to speaking about male genital schistosomiasis. Um, I, I think even more neglected than female genital schistosomiasis. <laughs> yes. Do you want to say something, Margaret? Uh, well, I'll leave it to the clinical person to tell us. I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible, I don't know, Amaya. Well, it's not an STI, it's not a sexually transmitted infection. So, because as I showed always with the water and the snail, you do need that life cycle to happen outside of the body, inside the snail, and then into the body again. So, a household transmission will not happen, uh, like with an STI, HIV, and all the rest. Uh, but what, what's unexplored that definitely interests me is the is the household dynamics so the water contact in that household the woman the man the child and how all that sort of plays together but but not transmission per se just the transmission dynamics and yes yes is definitely neglected <laughs> i agree and I'm not, I'm not trying to generalize on men and seeking to, you know, go and see a doctor or anything, but uh, definitely a lot of issues around seeking out medical advice for this sort of thing. Um, and this uh, cost me back to a session we did have at a previous conference on female and male genital schistosomiasis. So I'll put the link there if you want to find out more. Um, I think, Margaret, I don't want to make you late for your next meeting. We did have a couple fairly technical questions uh, on a diagnostics level, which uh, we could ask Amaya. But of course, if you need to go, um, you know, we wouldn't want to take any more of your time. And so um, 
it's it's up to you if you would like to stay for those. But uh, we just basically had a very quick question from Dr. Anna Kildemos, a mint parasitologist at the Leiden University Medical Center, uh, who was wondering what are the possibilities of using ultrasound in FGS and are we any closer to having usable data? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question and it's always a problem and because it's just not very good for FGS unfortunately. You would only have ultrasound detectable morbidity if you had a huge mass in the ovary for example and that could be detected by ultrasound but the things that you're going to miss are all those eggs that give you granulomas that don't protrude as much so it's not as easy as for the urinary tract which you see the polyps in the bladder a lot easier than in the genital tract. Um, I've had this conversation with, with radiology uh, friends and so on, and it's just not sensitive enough, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, and there was one last question from Poppy Lamberton, uh, again on diagnostics. Do you see a stronger link between CAA and FGS than FGS and urine egg count with FGS caused by the eggs produced but not success, sorry, successfully excreted, or indeed the relationship between CAA and urine counts? So we found that definitely women that had uh, positive CAA had more lesions, but then there was an age component as well. So they were not lesions, uh, sorry, PCR, so FGS by PCR, meaning that they definitely had a higher uh, worm load in their genital tract, and that was very active. And it was in our younger women which have more inflammation and things seem to be sort of younger and more active. So there is definitely a link between active infection and, um, and FGS, but there is not in the older women, which are the ones that I think we should really, as a clinician, you know, how do we get to those older women that are not having eggs anywhere detectable, that their worms may be a little bit more less active, uh, but we still need to treat. And then how are we going to get to those with old granulomas and calcified eggs, for example? Not easy. Okay, I have to leave thank now. You. Thank you yeah. very much, everybody. Margaret, and thank you so much. And mm -hmm. to be continued, uh, Amaya, thank you so much. Really? Um, yeah. yeah, we will be back from another webinar on FGS um, to follow up on this progress. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye okay, then. bye. Thank you.